certain thing with bonds. So th these bonds pay 10 12%, 15%, but the fund over the long run averages 6 to 8% because some of those companies default. That's why they're paying really high interest rates. The companies are struggling. A percentage of them fail and are not able to pay the full uh, dividend payment. Sometimes the companies go bankrupt and you only get 25 or 50% of the money back from the bond at all. So there's a lot of risk involved with that. But it's a different risk than you face with high quality bonds when interest rates are really low. So when interest rates are really high and I can get 7 or 8% and a quality bond, I don't want a junk bond. Why would I want to make 1% or 2% more and face a whole lot of risk? I'm not interested. But when interest rates are really low, you're forced, forced with making 1% or 2% very safely, or you go out to long-term where you can make maybe 4%, but now you're facing a lot of risk of, of losing 10 15 20 maybe even 40% if interest rates go up. So now high-yield bonds makes sense as part of the mix. Same thing with international bonds. They make sense as part of the mix. So there's a lot of different types of bond index funds, and they say they have a, a lot of the same advantages that a stock index fund has. It dramatically reduces your expenses. It dramatically reduces the transaction activity and keeps your costs low, and therefore you make more money. So hopefully... Uh, the regular listeners that got a little confused because I wasn't clear that index funds do not just apply to stocks. There's everything almost can be put into an index fund and created that way. It just means there's not a lot of trading. There's not a lot of activity. It's buy and hold. You always hear buy and hold. And an index fund is the ultimate application of that philosophy. So check that out. And somewhere in the next few weeks, probably we'll have to talk about the cushion and how uh, you could build that to protect yourself when you're in or close to retirement. And again, of course, you could always contact me, Phil, at Polaris Financial Planning. And if you can, please include your telephone number because the first thing I'm going to do, if you don't send it, is I'm going to send you an email back asking for it. So hopefully that made sense and we'll take a little commercial break and then we'll come back to our interview. You're listening to The Phil Ferguson Show on Secular Media Network. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are still listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. With me today is my special guest, Don Ford. And Don and I are going to talk about pharmaceuticals and drugs and stuff like that. And Don, uh, give me a little information about your background and what puts you in a position to know something about this stuff. Up until very recently, have been the senior financial analyst for a specialty compounding pharmacy located in St. Louis, Missouri, and trademarks and essentials connected to that company. Now, you said compounding pharmacy. Well, what does that mean? Okay, so a compounding pharmacy, rather than when you walk into, say, a Walgreens and you either get something off the shelf or you have somebody fill pills in the back for you, a compounding pharmacy is a pharmacy that takes the raw drugs, the uh, powders and creams and everything like that, and either turns it into a pill or turns it into a cream that they then sell to you. It's got maybe five, six drugs in it or however many your doctor prescribed. They compound it. They basically grind everything up, put it into another form that you can use, and then sell it to you because you don't have access to the raw chemicals yourself. And, and why would someone want this versus just going to the regular pharmacy and getting a pill? Well, in a regular pharmacy, there are much more stringent controls over, um, there are certain substances that are controlled substances. Testosterone is one of them. Uh, by law, you're not allowed to sell above a certain grade of testosterone on the open market. Uh, in fact, you can, actually, you can't sell any testosterone on the open market. A compounding pharmacy can because they have met the requirements to sell controlled substances. So that's one reason why you might go to a compounding pharmacy is you can get a controlled substance like testosterone much easier than you can try and get it through a normal pharmacy. Another reason is that your doctor can actually put very specific uh, quantities of each drug into the compounding mixture that he wants you to use. Whereas if you went to 
Walgreens and bought something off the shelf, that's regulated. The, the amounts of the chemicals in that are specifically set at the time of production. If you go to a compounding pharmacy, your doctor can change how much or how little of a certain chemical you're getting, and the compounding pharmacy can, can provide that. So if, if I understand correctly, if, if my doctor gives me two drugs instead of me taking two different pills, assuming I want to take them both at the same time, um, they could be mixed together and put into one capsule, one tablet, whatever my doctor recommends, and I just take that one pill and I'm, I'm good. Absolutely. Although what compounding pharmacies tend to specialize in are pain creams for people recovering from surgery, uh, wound creams for people who have exposed wounds or internal wounds, uh, dermatological creams for scarring um, and uh, tissue, and then um, I'm trying to think of the other one now. Um, those, those are the, oh, hormone replacement therapy. That's it. Hormone replacement therapy. So like your testosterone, progesterone, that kind of stuff. Okay, excellent. And now just for the listeners to know, because it's something that I don't talk about all the time. I spent 12 years as an auditor auditing uh, generic pharmaceutical purchases for uh, national retailers. Uh, if you think about the largest mainstream regular pharmacies in the United States. Uh, I did auditing work for most of them. Uh, I have 12 years of experience in seeing uh, pharmaceutical prices, uh, generic and brand, and the multitude of, of I guess, uh, creative money transferring that goes on in, in that system. Uh, so just so the listeners know that I have that background as well. And it's not something we normally talk about, but you and I happen to have a conversation where we talked about this subject, mm -hmm. and this seemed like the perfect time to, to bring it up. Uh, you had the idea. I wanted to start with uh, PharmaDude. Why don't you talk about him for a minute? Ah, uh, yes. So PharmaDude, otherwise known as Martin Shkreli, uh, last year founded and uh, established himself as CEO of a company called Turing Pharmaceuticals. That didn't happen last year. But what happened last year that made him uh, national news and even international news was uh, Turing Pharmaceuticals obtained the license to manufacture the drug Daraprim, which was being used to treat HIV patients. And it had been a generic, uh, meaning that uh, it could be manufactured by anyone. Um, and he raised it from what it had been at $13.50 a pill to $750 per pill. Now, the, the listener is probably going to think, well, if it's a generic, why don't I just get a different generic? Because you have to have a license to produce a specific generic. And and I'll, I'll just add in and fill in there that at the time, and correct me if I'm mistaken, at the time, this was the only generic on the market because the price was so low that everyone else mm -hmm. had stopped making it because it's $13. It's considered uh, you know, an older generic. It's a, it's a, a standard. They're the only person making the generic it's 13 bucks everyone else got out of the market because they couldn't make enough money and so because of that he just jacked the price and tried to make a fortune that's correct and again you can agree or disagree with me uh this increasing prices of generics especially if you're the only producer left after you know the competition weeds everybody else out uh often generic prices then do go up yeah, I, I remember one time there was a, a company, uh, three companies that made a generic uh, treatment that you put in your hair to uh, kill kill lice, and the price went down, 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 and one person after another finally got out of the market because they couldn't compete, they couldn't make any money, or at least they couldn't make enough money, and they finally got to the point where one manufacturer was left, and the price went from four dollars to ten. And no one entered the market, so it went from 10 to 15. No one entered the market, and it went from 15 to 25. And so they kept raising the price to try to maximize their profits, which is what companies tend to do. And mm -hmm. no one else came into the market because now that they had all gotten out, the the startup cost of, of getting all the legal documents and everything in line and getting the manufacturing up could take months and have a lot of upfront money and as soon as you get in, the guy who's already there goes right back down to $4. So you right. know, we have that. So what happened to, to PharmaDude? He, he's still rocking and rolling? 
No. Uh, Pharma Dude uh, got national or international backlash for doing this, but they couldn't pin him on that because it was perfectly legal. What they could pin him on, though, was securities fraud, which is what he did as part of one of his other companies. And so he went to prison and resigned as CEO of the pharmaceutical company, which then reverted its price back down to something closer to what it had originally been. Which is interesting. I talked to a lot of people and they hear that he got arrested and they're like, well, finally, you know, someone got arrested for jacking around with drug prices. Uh, I, I agree 100 percent. No. <laughs> uh, what he did, uh, unethical, uh, immoral, we can have that argument, but totally legal. Uh, but it was the securities fraud from uh, the uh, hedge fund that he ran before mm -hmm. uh, that he got caught for, which which is good. I think more of those kinds of people should be in jail. But uh, <laughs> that's more along the lines of the topics the show normally covers. Um, and so, you know, with these compounding pharmacies, uh, so a, the doctor sends the patient to your pharmacy. What prevents them from... Uh, getting their own pharmacy and, and sending their own patients to their own pharmacy to make even more money as a doctor? Well, technically, there is a law that is supposed to prevent exactly what you're describing. It's called Stark Law, and it specifically outlines that doctors are in no way allowed to profit from referrals or prescriptions that they give to their patients. However, there was a loophole and I don't know if it was state-specific or nationwide, but there was a loophole where doctors could uh, uh, have interest in a, um, pharm or a um, compounding pharmacy, and they could suggest to their patients, don't go use compounding pharmacy X, go use this compounding pharmacy that I know of. They do great work. And they're essentially sending business to themselves. And what, what those compounding pharmacies would do, um, since they are the manufacturer, much like in the uh, Pharma Dude story, since they're the manufacturer, they get to set the price. And what the doctors would do so that they could cover, and usually these were Medicare, Medicaid patients. Doctors don't make that much money off of a Medicare or Medicaid patient coming in with their copay. They don't get reimbursed as much as somebody with a private insurer. So what they would do is they would seek interest in these pharmacies that would compound stuff, send these Medicare and Medicaid patients to those pharmacies, and those pharmacies would set a generally really obnoxious price for the amount of material that was getting compounded. And Medicare and Medicaid would pay for it because it was a necessary drug for the patient and so the doctor would get the kickback from that and the process would just cycle that way well and that sounds like all kinds of bullshit and illegal right i mean that that's legal it, yes it's it's it was legal and it is bullshit and it hurt legitimate pharmacies like the one that i used to work for and and what, what how's that pharmacy doing now that pharmacy is closed because the market on pharm uh, compounding pharmacies has tanked thanks to a lot of these doctor-run compounding pharmacies across the nation. Now, we mentioned that there's a law against this, but yet they were still doing or they had a loophole. What? How exactly were they skirting the rule? They were skirting the rule because they didn't actually own the pharmacy and so they could say, well, you know, I'm not referring them to something I own. So therefore, I don't own it. And therefore, Stark law doesn't apply to me. So they were ignoring the intent of the law, but yes. living by the letter of the law. So they were technically Correct. it technically legal, but uh, probably any uh outside observer, neutral observer, would look at that and go, come on. Because they were charging such obnoxious rates for some of these drugs, which, I mean, testosterone in its raw form is pennies on the dollar, and they were charging thousands of dollars to having it compounded. What started happening is the DEA, FBI, 
and other governmental organizations that have an interest